All right, Mike, was uh, YouTube didn't want to start, so we are uh -oh. a few seconds uh, late. We're live but on Facebook? But here we are, yes. We're live on Facebook and oh, YouTube too. I can, see, I can see the YouTube now as well. Yeah. Show me a great advertisement. So when you go on YouTube, watch those well, advertisements. They're yeah. very entertaining. They help us out, for sure. Some so of the best advertisements I've ever Wednesday, seen. Wednesday, it started. Wednesday? Yeah. It's, yeah. It started Almost today. Over, we are live today again, Mike. We are live for live show number 48. Ooh, so who's going to be number 50? Who's going to be number 50? Ooh, it's going to be exciting. somebody next Monday, for sure. Next Monday. Because we're going to have another show on that's a big Friday. One. Guys, like if, a golden it's, anniversary. if it's the first time you, you are uh, live with us here, I'm Luca. I'm Mike. And Mike, we are the Underwater Tribe. We are a diving center based in Bali that uh, travels all over Indonesia. We do. And even all over the world. And we are quite active on social media. So since the pandemic, we started this live show. And now we are episode number 48. Yep. So if you haven't watched us or yet, this is the first time. You have plenty of hours. You can go and watch on our YouTube playlist yes. under the Underwater Tribe channel. Very easy. On YouTube yes. dot com dash underwater tribe. Don't forget if you're coming in... Uh, Say hi, hello Mike, hello Johanny, good to see you there. Say hi in the comments, in the chat. Don't forget to give a like to this show, please, and share it with your friends. Take two seconds, like it now, like, like, like. is important, click, so click. we can spread the love. Hello Miho, good to see you there too. <laughs> When's the last time you saw me? <laughs> Long Mijo? time, maybe lunch time. Wow, a great hours. lunch. Yeah, and today do, do, on the do, show. Do, do. We are going to continue our theme. We're going to talk about uh, shark, shark week. week. You know, we need a little... Uh, a little update. sharky over there. sharks. And we're going to talk about uh, one of the best places to see big sharks, which is in South Africa. Big sharks, little sharks. Yeah. Uh, and you, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned South Africa. So I just saw some... Let me talk to the camera. Let me see if I can find it for you. Go and find it. While you try to find that, I'm going to introduce the guest of today. Perfect who is uh, Walter Bernardis, which is one of the pioneer uh, diving down uh, down south in South Africa yeah, with the go. sharks like from Umkumas uh, to the Sardine Run and uh, doing those very nice uh, tiger shark dives in Umkumas uh, and uh, the Sardine Run, which is probably Amazing. the most incredible uh, display of... Uh, feeding friends in nature in the world it in the in the, the sea you know it is. probably the, probably it is it's the i, th I think you could get what i was trying to that say you see in africa yeah is, is that what it is on the sea yeah let, let me send you this because they've just had this again send it over sharks. on whatsapp i can Let's put it see on if we've got it because it's quite while you try to find that uh, oh, that it's going to take probably one minute at least to go there let me show something that we also posted on our Facebook page. What did we post? What did we because post? we're gonna keep we keeping up with the theme, and we posted this nice uh, infographic here. Do you remember your first time you had a shark encounter, and do you recall what species was? And you know what was really interesting here, like with the comments that we received. You would think, you know, like one of the most in tropical water, one of yep. the most common shark that you might see is the white tip reef shark, right. right? That, but it's incredible the variety of sharks that people have have seen for the first time. There are people that have seen whale shark for the first time. There That'd are people nice. like me that I see the wobbegon shark for the first time. That's it's quite of a weird weird shark. Which one was your first shark? Ever? Gray reef. Gray reef shark. Okay. That's nice. Yep. So when I was in, in the gloom, when I was in the Maldives working, I was uh, in South Area Atoll, and uh, we had few places with gray reefs, but we didn't see them that often, really? you know, down there. Mostly white tip reef sharks, and like to see a gray reef was really like, oh wow, there is a gray reef over there, incredible. Mine was the first dive after open water. I did open water in Kopangan, and then I was over in uh, Riley Beach, and we went to do a dive, and we're getting geared up, and of course. Dive masters, oh, we're probably going to see a shark on this dive. And I was, anybody nervous? And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, that would be me. But then, you know, as soon as you see it underwater, you're like, whoa, where'd ah, it go? But it was, it was really quite murky. Right. So you're like, oh, where did it go? And you you swim after it, and then all of a sudden it disappears in the gloom. You're like, 
Okay, so where did they go? A little, yeah. little nerve-wracking. Yeah, honest. same thing. You know, first time I've seen a white tip reef shark. Mm -hmm. And I was like, because the first shark I've seen, it was a wobbegon. And a wobbegon looks like almost like right, a, a pancake. Pet, you know, like it's over there. It doesn't do much. It's flat on the bottom. And then all of a sudden, I am uh, I think I was um, diving the Navy Pier in uh, Exmouth. Oh, okay. And uh, I was there with Miho too. And uh, we were diving. And all of a sudden, we see this white tip that comes quite close. And I was like, whoa, that looks like a shark. You know, like... A proper shark. Yeah, proper shark. Exciting. But, and that's the beauty of it. And now we all became Black some shark right. addict. Did you send me the thing you wanted I to I did. Let and the thing check. that I wanted to send you is, uh, it seems like the orcas are misbehaving again in South Africa. So oh. we're talking about South Africa and we're talking about Where sharks. The, uh, the orcas are predating, preying upon yeah. the great whites again. And so here they, you can see nicely that uh, they go for the, their liver, the liver yeah. right? They just eat the liver, they suck yeah. the liver juice out. It's and what an amazing bye predator. Bye. You've got this huge shark and it just comes in and goes... Whoosh. Takes the one bit it wants and mm -hmm. off it goes. Yeah, pretty amazing. And you know, like also there is this stereotype thinking that uh, sharks are on top of uh, the, <laughs> is the <laughs> apex predator of the ocean. That I, but no, it's the orca, it's right? Two. Orca is there. Yeah, cool. So Walter Bernardes again, great uh, pioneer. I mean, great talk uh, coming up uh, in a few in a few minutes uh, with him and. And incredible, incredible images also given by Eduardo. Thanks, Eduardo. I see you. You are there in the comment. In the yes. Hello, Is there in the comment? Thank and uh, thanks for the photos because uh, they can really fill in the narrative. And uh, some great photos as well. We put uh, links uh, of uh, Walter in uh, in the description because he is also um, he owns a dive center. Dive center. Yep. Yeah. And then you, if you would like to go to see the sardine run over there, is probably one of the best. Speaking and then yeah, he's out there right now. Oh yeah, really, he's out. He's over there. Not on a uh, commercial thing, but yeah. they're out there. They they got permission to go out there for um, research of some description to go out under the. They say he's saying that, and I, b I believe he says it in, that in they the interview. interview yeah, they've yeah. seen more sardines in the this year than they've seen in the last twenty years. Uh -huh, of course, uh -huh. the year where you can't go out is the is the year that uh -huh. it happens. Obviously. And a very nice uh, crowd is building up on our channel. Good to see you all there, guys. Don't forget to give a like to this show and, sh and, fo and uh, share it with your friends. Great to see you all there. And uh, again, if you want to see more of the images that we are putting on this show, you can go also to Eduardo Instagram that we placed there in, in the comments, uh, in the description. Sorry, not in the comments, in the description of this live show. And then you can see more and more beautiful images about the Sardi run itself. It made me really thinking, you know, like I want to go to see, I, I have to go to see the Sardi run. It's one of those things that it's hard to do, right? It's mm. cold. Uh, because it's winter during this yep. time of the year over there and uh, stay out at sea is choppy and things you're waiting for the action and when the action happens it's super cool for sure so it's not an easy work to do but I think it's something that uh, if you really like sharks and if oh. you really like uh, nature and uh, behavior list. is uh, definitely on the bucket list is I had actually one of the a, thing to try a friend of mine he was at the time it's about maybe about 10 12 years ago he was working in um, he was working in Libya, of all places. And he's like, oh, yeah, Mike, I'm going to I'm gonna get you to come with me. I'm going on the sardine run. I'm going to pay you to get from Indonesia over to here. All, right. all you've got to do is is film the whole encounter. Uh, we're going to do the sardine run together. And then I'm so going like to take you on a, a safari with me as well afterwards with the family. All you got to do is, you know, you can do whatever you want with the footage that you, that you take. But you also have to give me a copy uh, that you edit for the family. Right. And I was like, yes, this is going to be the best thing. And then it fell through. It was like, oh. No. Yeah. Right. So and evidently it didn't turn out to be the greatest uh, sardine run that year anyways. But mm -mm. Man, it was like, oh, yeah, that was my one chance. And I didn't go. Absolutely. I, well, we're going to go. We're going to go. Who wants to come? Let us know later. Send well, us a direct message. I and think we, we should ask go. that question after we show all this. After images. we show all this. Then yes. ask it again. Yes. All right, guys, shall we go in the Let's go and have interview? a look. Yeah. Let's go Eduardo, straight are you into ready the for interview. Your big, uh, your, your big thing here? Eduardo's the star today. Here we go. Today on the show from South Africa, we have got Walter Bernardes. How are you, Walter? 
Yeah, all good. Hello to everybody. Hi, Luca. How's it, Mike? Excellent. Hey. Excellent. How you guys been? Good. 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 We would rather be right there in South Africa at the moment, especially with the sardine being all over the place. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been an unbelievable year for the sardines. Uh, I've never, and I, I am now, I think, 63 years old, eh? And uh, I've lived on this coastline my whole life, and I have never seen this much fish come past here um, ever. So yeah. what's been going down on the wild coast up till now must be mind-blowing. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. The one absolutely. year that you can't get in the water. Yeah, exactly. You know, this year it should have happened. Crazy, crazy. But uh, but uh, we were having a little bit of chat uh, off camera before. You're saying you're going out. Actually, you have the chance to go out tomorrow, right? Yeah. Tomorrow, uh, we've got a, a film production company that's uh, going to be doing some live presentations daily from the 2nd of July. So we, we're traveling down tomorrow. And uh, hopefully, we'll be on the sea, weather permitting, from the 2nd to around the 6th or 7th of uh, July. And we'll be doing some live uh, uh, posts from, from out there, showing the people, uh, you know, what's going on and hopefully uh, getting some underwater action, which we'll edit and, and uh, push out in the evenings. Very cool. That's awesome. So people can get a little bit of a teaser and more feeling like I need to go there and see that. Well, we will get into the Sardi run a little bit later on, uh, onto the show, into the show. But however... For the people that um, don't know you, tell us a little bit uh, your story, how you got, uh, let's say, into the diving business. Um, well, uh, you know, I, uh, I was always interested in the sea. I loved the sea. I used to go surfing, a lot of spear fishing. And um, in 1982, I did my sports diver with Naui. It wasn't open water one and advanced in those days. It was just sports diver. And um, then started working with African Water Sports as, as a uh, contractor. So when they needed an extra boat, I would supply the extra boat. And eventually bought the company from uh, the Addisons and um, went, to, went on my own here. So, um, you know, we, we were diving right from the early days where, you know, shark diving was diving with a reggae, a spotted reggae to shark to uh, pioneering the, the tiger shark dive. And right. uh, so, um, you know, my era took us through all that. You know, in the old days, um, when you heard about uh, tiger sharks and you read any books about tiger sharks, they told you, you know, get out the water. They're unpredictable, they're vicious, they eat anything. Uh, and uh, we've managed to turn that around today uh, when people see a tiger shark, they want to jump in the water, you know, and, and go yeah. and, and view it and take photographs. And there's been a whole percep perception change around what you can and can't do with these apex predators. Right. And, and this really, I think, uh, it, it turned around during uh, when, like, uh, would, would you say like the early 2000, uh, like the first 2000, yeah, I would 2005? Say, uh, late 90s. Yeah. Late 90s is when we started with the Tigers. And um, um, my friend Mark Addison was the one that actually got the idea to start baiting for them on the Alloa show. And uh, I picked it up uh, with him and we basically pioneered the, the Tiger shark diving in this area and uh, most probably the world. Eh? But what was the, what was the thing that... Uh made you think so until that moment you explained it before and, and it was like it's like we if we were associating let's say tiger shark diving we would have thought like to be in a cage or something like that you know it's, it's a big big shark and it has a bad reputation and what was the thing that made you switching and thought like okay now i can jump in the water and we can make this dive uh well it, it started off very controlled eh so um we had a place called Tiger Cave, which was a, a sort of a cave at 14 meters, and it was like a meter and a meter and a half high, and you could basically kneel in the cave, and uh, your head just didn't touch the the top. 
and we would put bait on the outside of the cave and we would sit like crayfish on the inside of the cave and then um, wait for the sharks to come in. Um, it was quite a procedure to get everybody in this cave and right. at the same time as the sharks arrived. But um, that's quite a long drawn out story. I'm not going to go into that. But um, suffice it to say that it actually worked very well. And um, eventually, um, you know, at 14 meters, you had one hour to stay there. And, and you know, your air is pretty limited as well. On a 12 liter tank, after an hour, you're running short. And there was a lot of instances where the, um, the sharks would still be outside eating the, the bait that we had put in the rocks. And um, we had to go up because of deco or because of yeah. air. And we didn't know what to expect those first couple of, of times huh. that we dived with the shark. So we get out uh, all very nervous, go up the line, the boy line to the surface. And, um, and uh, you know, the, the sharks didn't seem to be too aggressive. They didn't seem to be, um, you know, you know, they seem to be quite relaxed in their approach. And uh, after a few times of that happening, uh, we started changing our sort of modus operandi with the, how, how we were doing the dive. And we started baiting on the surface instead of baiting on the bottom. Right. And um, we'd anchor the boat above the, the, the cave. And we'd do it this very same way as they do the great whites. Throw a big head out the back. And then when the shark comes in, Pull the head towards the boat and uh, we had a line hanging off the off the boat we didn't have a cage we just had a, a, a heavy weight with a rope going down to about uh, uh, 10 meters and we'd hang on we'd hang on the rope and the the sharks would get pulled past past us over over our heads so we'd be hanging on the rope like trapeze artists and watching these tiger sharks chasing the heads you know over above us and take the photos and and whatever, you know. Wow. But the, the problem with, with that was that every time the boat went up, you know, you went up. And every yeah. time the boat went down, the weight would pull you down. So it was like, oh, up, down, up, down. Right, right, right. And um, in a strong current, you'd be you'd be lying at an, like a 30 degree angle type of thing. Yeah, and, it um, yeah exactly. So you put the rope behind you, uh, behind your shoulder and around your leg. So you, 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 both your hands were free to film and um, that's the way we did it. But uh, what happened one day when the strong current and big uh, surf um, swell, the anchor broke right. and the boat started drifting away. Suddenly, you know, we didn't have this, this uh, same intense up and down um, on the rope and, and the sharks followed us. So the next step from there was, okay, we're going to put a buoy instead of the boat, put a bait in a, in a bucket that it can't get at, and, um, and chuck that in the water and see if we could follow, follow that. They would follow us down the, down the current, you know? Right. Oh, so do it so, as a drifter. That, yeah, it worked out very well. Yeah. We used to use a stainless steel drum from the washing machine and uh, stack that full of bait uh anchor anchor the boat to get the sharks there and then release uh what we call a stem it would be a uh, the buoy uh, 10 meters of, of uh, cable and then the bucket at the bottom of that cable mm. and the sharks would follow that for kilometers as long as you had bait in that bucket those sharks would follow us it would just and, go. Uh, all in the water, and it was a yeah, fantastic experience you know and we started to learn um uh, what to do, what not to do, uh, to try and, and make this as, as safe a dive as possible. Right, right, and right. it was like years of, of uh, you know, making small mistakes and learning from our mistakes to be able to, um, to dive with these apex predators safely. Incredible. Now, In how many, uh, how, what kind of numbers of tigers were you having on a dive? Yo, uh, my best was nine tigers wow. around me, where I could count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, Mark uh, said the best he had was 15 tigers. Amazing. And 
Yeah, no, the, the Tigers were really prolific in the early days, but their numbers have been dropping off year by year, you know. Uh, although we're working in a marine protected area, these Tigers uh, travel over vast areas. They, they are very pelagic animals. And obviously when they leave um, the, the protection of the marine protected area, you know, they're fair game to fishermen, to uh, the fin trade, to the long liners, right. um, all of that. Right. Well, and so the, the, are dives like this? Say again? Sorry, they, they, I was saying that it is, uh, there are actually dives like this that really change the perception we all had. You know, like, uh, of course, we are divers. We, we are always uh, very concerned and to... Um, to the to the environment and to sharks protection is one of our um, main uh, main thing that we like to advocate but we're really like you know these give big ammunition to all of the people that wants to protect sharks to say like hey guys look they are not those mean predators that you were thinking that you have to kill to keep the ocean safe you know like they just mind their own thing and we can die with them and they are even very yeah. valuable right absolutely you know uh they there's that old adage that says uh you only protect what you love you only love what you understand and uh, you only understand what you taught and when it comes to sharks you know we taught fear 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 all the time and uh we 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 had the approach that uh yes baiting wasn't a natural um sort of setup where, you know, we were attracting the sharks artificially, but the sharks in our area were, were here for a limited time only. And, um, you know, the, the value of bringing somebody in contact with a shark to be able to see, to understand that, that they're not these uh, terrible predators that will rip you to pieces the moment you jump in the water, um, was invaluable in spreading the word throughout the world that, you know, these sharks need to be loved, they need to be protected. Yeah. And um, uh, hopefully we did a little bit when it came to that, you know? Sure, absolutely. Although, <laughs> it's, a, it's a big fight. Uh, it's it's not, not by any means the end of, of, of this fight. We need, we need to keep pushing it because uh, there's a lot of divers that, that um, are, you know, totally scared of sharks and um, you know when you see what happens maybe in the Red Sea with those attacks there mm. which in my opinion are, are nearly always diver uh, error related you know they're not they're not being taught how to get in the water with these uh, predators and uh, if you're not breathed properly you don't know how to react you don't know what to expect and therefore you get accidents like you have in the Red Sea with the Longi Monas has, has bitten a few people. Yep. Right, right. Um, so, you know, we need to educate divers in the right etiquette in the presence of apex predators. Mm -hmm. What other kind of sharks do you, do you, are you getting? Uh, have, you, have you ever had a, have you ever had a great white walk up to Ali Wall Shoal one time? And, I didn't expect that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, I'm one of the few, uh, one of the only lucky people that have had the opportunity to, to dive with all three apex predators on one dive and that uh, you'll pick up maybe on my facebook there on african water sports the the whale dive and uh, there we had two great whites we had about 20 tigers uh, we had uh, zambezis which is the bull shark we had black tips we had duskies we had other sharks that i don't know what they were but but, um, you know, we've dived uh, in open water with, with great whites. And this whole thing about saying you cannot dive in open water, with, you can only dive in the cage, is uh, complete nonsense in my, uh, in my book. Eh? Right. Um, they are uh, the same as, as the tigers and the bull sharks, the apex predators. If you apply the right rules, you can dive with these animals safely. You don't have to pay somebody under the table all the time, you know, to be able to do it. People need to need to realize that they, uh, you know, you know, stop vilifying these animals as 
as uh, you know, you can't dive. You, if you get in the water with a great white, the same story they told us with the tigers. You know, when I started with the tiger shark diving here, the, the local dive charters told me, no, you're going to kill a lot of people, you know? Right. These things are vicious. And that's exactly the same thing they're telling you with the great whites. Yep. And you can dive with those great whites safely. You can um, interact with them, apply the same rules that you apply to all the other apex predator sharks, and, and you can dive. I have dived with them many times. Uh, and here I am, you yep. know? Yeah. Still got my hands and fingers and legs. <laughs> still, still got everything, right? And then, uh, but tell me something. So you probably, with all these uh, shark dives that you've been making and all these shark encounters that you've been having, you probably learn a great deal of their behavior, right? So are, are there sometimes some moments in which you think like, okay, now it's time to get out of the water? I've never, I've never felt that I had to get out the water, but you do pick up on certain sharks that that they, they are a little bit, um, you know, they each got their own personalities, and uh, you pick up that this one is a is a bit of a uh, different from the run of the mill. He's he's he or she is acting a little bit differently, so um, you need to bring the group a bit together, you know, more together, more controlled. Uh, don't let a shark approach the, the divers when it is one of those sharks. And, um, uh, you know, never, I bet you, maybe, I, the only thing I dive with is, is uh, my GoPro and a stick, you know, and that's all I use. And um, uh, you do pick up individuals that are acting, a, I, would, I would hesitate to say the word aggressively, but are taking a more, in, a more keen interest in you. Right. And uh, then you just fall back to, uh, you know, tightening the group up because the group is always bigger than the individual. And uh, when you separate yourself from the group, when you target yourself, uh, you make yourself a target with apex predators. Stay with the group and, uh, you know, uh, right. it, it, it seems to calm them down. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, with a shark like that, you, you, if you control the, the bait, you control the behavior. So you see, okay, this shark is acting a little bit aggressively. Um, I shouldn't have said aggressively, but he's acting a bit more inquisitive. Excited, yeah. He's more all over the place. He's not scared of anything. Then you just slow down with the, with the bait and he slows down his behavior as well. Ah, okay. Until, until he becomes more accustomed to the whole setup. He knows those people over there, they okay. We don't interfere with those. And uh, then you can start releasing the bait again so that, uh, you know, you keep them interested. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the shark's mind basically has got like a three switch, three pole switch. He's in cruise mode most of the time. And then from cruise mode, he flicks to flight, which is escape or fight, which is attack. So we like to keep him in the cruise mode more towards the attack side where he, he's interested, you know, but he's not quite fully committing to the attack side. And, um, um, you know, and, and, and um, so, we, you know, you've got to try and bear this in mind when you're diving with these apex predators all the time. You don't want to chase them away, but you, do, you don't want to end up uh, being food either, you know. Right. So there's various mechanisms that we'll use like controlling the bait, controlling the group, to to controlling what we're wearing, very important. And lastly, controlling our actions to the shark. The two basic rules when it comes to apex predators is if you look like food, you know, it's might gonna take you to be food, you know. Right. And uh, diving with a great white, with quite a prominent diver, um, free diving out the cage. And uh, he, he put silver fins on, you know? So I said to him, hey, but you know, the eating silver things like you're putting on your feet. So I said, nah, man, that's rubbish. They don't see colors. Well, well. after that time, there was the last time that he put that silver, silver fin on, <laughs> you know? That, that shark buzzed him so badly that um, he realized, okay, 
the don't look like food right. part is very important. Equally important is don't act like prey. If you act like prey, you're gonna they're gonna act like predator. So you've got to try and 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 uh, control your 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 uh, flight uh, instinct. You know, right. oh shit, yeah, oh, I go and start yeah. trying to get out. You moving backwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're never gonna get away. So you got to control that and 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 keep calm, uh, keep eye contact, and uh, that's always worked for me, hundred percent. Just those two simple rules, you know. Yeah. Don't act like food and don't look like food. Yeah, have, have kept me alive. Yeah, but it, it, I think it's still very, very hard. You know, like I almost feel like I would bring that an open water diver as a decoy. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. The people watching. I'm kidding. It's just a bad joke. <laughs> yeah. no, anyway, it's like um, as you said, like you, you, you need to to keep facing the the shark, but it's still hard. I mean, like if for you must bring in there so many people, you know, and many of them, they never experienced this kind of that. And when you have like this apex predator coming, I mean, this far or closer to you to keep your cool, yeah. you know, like it's, uh, it's quite kind of tough, right? No, that's where your guide is, is very important. You know, uh, before you get in the water, the guide has got to give a very comprehensive, uh, uh, briefing and sometimes uh, people once I've, I've given the briefing which normally takes about 20 minutes uh, they they think to themselves you know like do do I really want to do this you know and I have to explain to them you know I'm not telling you this to make you scared I'm telling you this to give you power to give you knowledge so that if you are presented with a situation you know how to react and um you know, as, as a guide as well, you've got to be the buffer between the, between the shark and the diver, where you've got casual divers, where you've got professional shooters, you know, they want the shark right here. So you don't want to go in and get in between that. But they've got the big camera to hide behind. Yeah. You know, so it's different when you're holding a GoPro and you're <laughs> trying to hide yourself behind this GoPro. Right. It's, it's a bit... It gets a bit difficult, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, the bigger uh, the camera, the better it is. As you, you might know, is sharks are attracted to to cameras, strobes, GoPros. You know, they love that stuff. And it's a, it's an electronic signal that it gives off, especially the strobes when they fire and they reload. You know, you you'll you'll see those the sharks trying to mouth the strobe because it's the signal it's giving must be very close to the the signal distressed fish give, uh, I can only imagine. So you've got to warn the, the, the camera guys that haven't dived with shark before um, to expect that because it can be very disconcerting. You know, when you look up and you see uh, a black tip or a, or a tiger or whatever <laughs> latched onto your strobe and you're thinking, oh God, try and put it away, you know? <laughs> and that's the worst thing you can do because the more you fight with it, <clears throat> the more it thinks it's alive, you know? Right. So most sharks, once they've bitten it, they realize that uh, you know it's not food, and they'll let it go immediately. But uh, you, you you get those that, that require a bit of convincing as mm -hmm. well. You know? Yeah, and then so we saw few tiger sharks popping up that beautiful, majestic, big, but you have also so many black tip sharks in there, like. Uh, really like more than 20 looks like or 30. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, we can have 50 plus black tips. And uh, yeah, when we started this dive, there were no black tips. You know, we used oh, to wow. just get tigers. And uh, then after a few years, I'm not sure when exactly, we started getting the black tips coming in. And, uh, and then the black tips would move off and we'd get juvenile duskies coming in. And then that, and then would start all over again. Tigers, then the black, then the duskies, and uh, now the black tips just don't go away. You know, they, we've got a resident uh, shoal here uh, that that stays that stays here year round, and um, you know offers some great shark uh, photographic opportunities and um, a yeah, very nice shark sharks. Now, but very good introduction shark you know to to be in the water with 
there's so many of them. Do you think it's what? Because I guess you guys haven't been out diving now in three months or something. When you go back there, how do you expect the black tips to react? Sure. Let's hope they're still there. Yeah. And they haven't all been fished out by right. some, some Japanese or Chinese longliner. Right. Um, I, I don't think uh, I don't I don't expect any any uh, difference in their behavior. To be quite honest. Um, but who, who knows? That's a that's an interesting question. Yeah, it should be interesting. <laughs> will, they, will they still be there? Will all our old uh, friends be there? Because right. uh, there's, there's quite a few. I don't name them, but uh, you know that that uh, you know this one. You recognize right. all the different uh, uh, sharks that that always come around and and uh, entertain you. You know, right? Definitely. So Walter, on um. Do you go out uh, to do this sort of uh, dive uh, like all year round? Yeah, yeah. So the our season basically starts with the tigers uh, in November. Okay, it's pre-season. Then December through to um, April, May it starts uh, dropping off a bit again, and then June and July you get you get the the sardine run. Right. End of of, yeah, so end of July, uh, I normally go and do the Nile Crocs up in uh, the Okavango. And then um, at the same time as the sardines, uh, we have the, the spotted ragged two sharks arriving on the reef. Um, and, they, and they're here from uh, June right through to about February, the last, the last ones leave. So we've got the year-round uh, sharks on the Elowal. Nice. And, um, okay. Yeah, so, for everybody. so if we want to see tiger shark in Aliwal and also the sardine run, we need to do the two trips, right? So if you want to, if you want to do tigers and the sardine run, well, you're going to come in early June, but that is like, uh, you know, it's the end the, of the one is really not really the beginning of the other one. If I want to do them yeah, nicely, yeah. I come like, what, like March, April for tigers and then reset, come again, uh, mid June or something. That would be the better plan. Yeah. 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 Awesome. You'll Speak always get sharks, you know, you'll get, uh, if you come in June, you're going to get the raggies, you're going to get the black tips and you're going to get the sardines after that. Right. But the tigers, you know, they they uh, they more in the summer months, more December to April. Yeah, okay. You know, your your best period. Excellent. Speaking of the sardine run, when did you uh, when did you do your first sardine run? Like when did it uh, when did it become something that the dive operators in South Africa started doing? Yeah, no, again, uh, I've got to thank Mark Edison. Uh, he, he's the one that came up with a concept as well. And, um, you know, we, uh, went down, uh, and did the, and did the sardine run. Now I'm trying to think maybe 23 years we've been doing the sardine run. So where does that put us? Yeah. 96, 97. 97. Yeah. Around there. That's when we started. And, um, uh, you know, it uh, it was thanks to him that that I got involved with with the uh, with the diving number one with the with the tigers with the sardine run, and um, uh, with him we pioneered them both, and um, yeah, in the, in all those years, it's been every year has been something new, something different, something spectacular. It's it's been a, a, a real uh, pleasure for us to do every year. Eh? Yeah, sir. Amazing. Yeah. So we, we've seen like a few videos of the action, which happens like uh, under the, the sardine run, but we also seen some, uh, some videos of the action that it takes to get out there. Like the launching for instance, <laughs> with the, with the ding, it looks pretty scary. Like how, like you are a skipper, right? How do you keep yeah. your cool in such a swell, man? <laughs> In surf, in such a you know, surf, that, not swell. Uh, <laughs> I, I, on some days, uh, I question my sanity. I can tell you, 
And, uh, you know, it's experience of looking at the water and being able, you know, when, when, you, when you're working in surf zones like we do all the time, so we, we got to go through waves to get to the open ocean and then uh, travel to wherever. So, um, um, you know, you always, as, as uh, you got to read the waves, being a super helps, you know, that, that you're seeing when there's a lull in the sets. Also, there's always a, a safe spot that you can sit in. And you got to identify that safe spot that you can put your boat in. And you know, if you keep in that, in that zone, you like 99% safe. And you're waiting all the time for the lull to come. And when the lull comes, then you go out. It's, I, I, I must tell you, it, it's an art. And uh, not sure. everybody can do it, but everybody can learn it, you know? And um, uh, some learn a bit quicker than others. Having surf experience helps, you know? Yeah, working with waves and that. Um, but it is, it is, uh, it's quite, it it's is, quite uh, something, awesome. right? <laughs> Gets when, the heart rate going. When, yeah, I saw boats uh, going like, whoa, up like that. And, and I think it was, uh, was not long ago, maybe a couple of years ago, that there was the surfing competition that, down in Jeffreys Bay. And so one of the skippers actually that all of a sudden got caught inside all this big set of waves and he rode one of those yeah. waves. Like if nothing was, it just stayed there like, and he is riding now this uh, bigger than 10 foot, 10, 15 foot wave with the dinghy, you know, like it's crazy, crazy skill. I think uh, that you guys are some of the most skillful guys. That guy caught, got caught inside and, and was doing everything he can just to, to stay uh, away from that wave. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't think he, he did that purposefully, though the way I saw it. Mm, but right. anyway, no, yeah, yeah, no, it was not purposely. It was all of the sudden, like I mean, and, yeah. but he made it out of it, like is yeah. like a champion. What was nice about what was nice about seeing that was uh, it it gave you an idea of what those boats are capable of doing, you know, and uh, surviving. So um, the we use eight meter ribs. Most people have got uh, 92, uh, 90 horsepower uh, motors on the back, four strokes. And, uh, you know, the, the rib has been designed around our, our condition. It's, it's gone through um, a few different uh, designs from when we started. And uh, we pretty much got a design now that, that works very well, that is pretty safe and comfortable for the divers. Excellent, excellent stuff. Let's talk a little bit about this uh, sardine run like that, because I always imagine it, imagined it to be uh, really offshore in, in the middle of the ocean. But then I saw some uh, pictures coming from friends like that. Sometimes you actually see the reefs even like below you and the coastline close by. Yeah, yeah. So how, how are you yeah, guys, uh, where is the best, uh, put, where is how, how do the sardines spread along the coast of South Africa and where is the best spot to, to go and see them? Yeah, you can split the, the sardine run into three areas. The first area is off Cape Town, the Gullis Banks, where the aggregation occurs, where they, where they gather, okay? From there, um, the shoals start moving up the coastline in around June sometime. The, the movement normally is spurred by um, cold fronts that hit the Cape in the winter months. So you've got the cold fronts hitting the Cape, uh, Cape of Storms there. That's why it's called the Cape of Storms. It hits there and, that's, and that starts uh, sending the sardines up, up the coastline. There used to be two migrations from those Agalas banks. One up the, the west coast towards Namibia and one up the east coast up our coastline. The one up the west coast got totally annihilated, got fished out to the, to the point where uh, there were no more fish and the trawlers and everything closed down. Right. Then they got the idea a few years ago to start um, netting in Mossel Bay. Now they're doing the same on our east coast run and uh, they're having quite an impact on, on the number of fish that come through. Although this year, 
I don't know if it was COVID-19 that those trawlers couldn't get out or what, but I have never seen so much fish in my life. <clears throat> the reason why they move up is not really clear. Some people say that they, um, you know, like the salmon that go up the rivers and spawn, if in, and, and the, when the, the next generation spawn, they also go up the river, the same river and spawn there. So, um, so that, that's why they've, they've annihilated the West Coast Shoal now, and um, there's only the East Coast Shoal that, that remains. Um, they've got to move through a lot of deep water off the Trans Sky, the area that we work in. The continental shelf comes right close to the, to the, um, to the shore uh, in the Trans Sky. So for the predators to feed on the sardines, They've got to go down, corner a small pocket of, of the sardines and force them to the surface. Once they're on the surface, they keep that, that uh, bait ball, we call it a bait ball there, by uh, physical presence of the dolphins swimming around it, by the, by the bubbles, by their sonar, and um, then everything feeds on that. The birds from the top, the sharks and dolphins, the brooders whales from the bottom as well. And, and of course, the, um, the, the, the different variety of dolphins that we get feeding on, on, on that shoal as well. Right. Then so, the third that... area, yeah, please go ahead. The third area is when they move into the, the Natal coastline. And that's when you see all those aerial photographs of that big black um, uh, stain of sardines moving right. close to the shoreline. Now, there's a reason why we don't do the sardine run here. I live here on the, on the, on the, the tail shoreline, so it would be easy for me just to go out there and do the sardine run here. But um, because that shoal is like maybe 100 meters long, you could have 200 sharks in that, in that uh, area, but uh, one shark is feeding down there, the other sharks are feeding down there, and, and they, they're very spread out. The, the, the predators, don't have to get them in a bait ball. They're already compact in a bait ball for them. Between the, the surface, you know, being very shallow and, and the bottom, only about three meters, oh. the waves on the one side and the predators on the outside. So, you know, they can feed along the along the bait ball, you know, when they feel like it. Right. Whereas in the transfer to feed, they, they've actually physically got to get that sardine shoal up to the surface in the form of a bait ball. Mm -hmm. Then keep it there and keep attacking it and feeding until it's finished. Right. So that's, that's the basically why we, we go to the Trans Sky and not here. Yeah, gotcha. And w one thing that uh, you, you, you actually were mentioning when you were explaining how this uh, ball is forming is actually that it seems like are the dolphin the one doing the work to put them in bowls? Yeah. It's usually the dolphins. Uh, I would say 90% of the time, it's dolphins that are, are, are going down, getting the, the sardines and bringing it up and, and forming that bait ball. Mm -hmm. But I have seen, I would say, 10, uh, maybe a bit less than 10%, but where sharks have got the bait ball on their own. And uh, what we call a shark bait ball, and, and it is one of the most intense shark experiences that you can have where there's literally hundreds of sharks that are just attacking this this uh this bait ball no dolphins um uh, just the birds and the sharks and uh really really uh, an intense an intense uh uh experience amazing right. uh, some of the some of the the most frightening things about the, the sardine run is, is the smaller bait balls. You'll get a, the bait ball about the size of a, like a, a dining room table, you know. It looks like you would fit it into a couple of wheelbarrows. And you've got this intense shark action going on, 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 on those sardines. And those sardines don't take long to realize if you're in the water that, that the sharks don't like you. Right. And if they come to you, They'll be protected from the shark. Ah. So the most frightening thing that can happen on the sardine run is when those, those sardines come against you 
and you can feel them all hitting your body and it also partially impairs your vision because of the numbers of sardines in front of you and you know just on the other side is hundreds of sharks trying to get those sardines well i tell you what if you want an adrenaline spike <laughs> you'll get one in that situation yeah, I, I, sure. and you've got to know what you do what do you do yeah what, yeah what do you do <laughs> You'll have to come and find out. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully you yeah. don't get bitten mm -mm. because there has been a, a few over the years that have, that have had uh, a nibble or two. By accident. Yeah, the numbers of people that I know have been bitten on the sardine run. I'm, uh, I, I think I only know of two people that have been bitten on the sardine run. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so uh, what, what, what? The golden rule on the sardine run is don't go in the bait ball. Right. If you go in the bait ball, you're going to have problems. And mm -hmm. both those people that, that were bitten went into the bait ball. Aye. So what, what happens with, with a shark, he's coming through the bait ball at speed. And when, whenever he's, because, you know, they've got those lact lactating membranes, when, they, when they're going through, they're protecting themselves. So they haven't got all the time, you know, their eyes open. Sometimes they've got their lactating membrane up and they know as soon as something touches, it's likely that it's sardine and they bite. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they're coming through that bait ball and they're snapping and they're trying to get as many sardines as they can. If they bump into you, guess what they're going to think? Sardine. Sardines. And right. they're going to bite you. Mm -hmm. So stay outside the bait ball and, uh, and you'll be 99% you'll be safe, mm -hmm. you know? So we've had literally, there's been thousands and thousands and thousands of divers, um, you know, to, uh, that have been on the sardine run, that have experienced the sardine run. And, um, and there's only two people that I know that have, one had a little bite on his finger, uh, which was like a couple of stitches. Um, oh, sorry, three. There was a Frenchman also that got bitten on, on uh, but he had this, silver camera it was uh, this wasn't the greatest and the shark came out of the bait ball he was really close to the bait ball saw the silver and just snapped right you know, and it got him across his, mm. his hand and his and his face a little bit but um but what do i do what the it, it, was a, a british guy that was inside the bait ball also filming thinking that this is a good place to be and he got bitten across the, the arm here across the elbow yeah. But again, bitten and, and let go. And uh, I think he was out in the water the next day, you know? So, yeah, okay. Minor, minor, yeah. Uh, minor injuries is... Uh, one thing, Walter, what do you do? Like, if they're coming to me, the sardines, I need to keep swimming to, to stay away from it, right? Yeah, you, stay on, you stay on the outside of the bait ball all the time. So you got to keep moving. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, if, if that bait ball does, if that's small, it is a smaller bait ball and they come, do come right up against you, then the answer is, you know, don't go up, go down. And uh, swim down as fast as you can. And uh, the, 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 the fish try and stay on the surface for some reason. I don't know why they feel that they, they have more protection there. Yeah. But they seem to stay there. You bolt down and then away and then come back up again. Get on the boat. Um, you know, as I've, I've experienced it maybe twice in, uh, in all the years that I've been out there. And so it's not a regular occurrence, firstly, but it, it needs to be in the back of your mind, you know, what happens if, you know, this is what you're going to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some of the protocols to follow in case of, because I guess that we all would kind of uh, freak out if all of the sudden all that bait is around us. We can connect that pretty quickly, you know. <laughs> you know. And uh, 100%. so w we do that uh, snorkeling or we do that uh, with scuba tank? You know, um, so you've got a lot of stuff happening on the sardine run. It's not just sardines. It's whales. You know, you get, um, you get pilot whales, you get a majority is humpback whales, you get southern right whales, and you get brooders whales. So you get like at least four different species of whales that are happening at that time of the year. Then you, then you have dolphins. You have, you've got uh, uh, common dolphins, 
You've got um, humpback dolphins, which are rare now. You've got um, bottlenose dolphins that are also in the area. And then all your variety of sharks. Um, then you've got um, uh, the, the bait that's coming up at that time of the year is also prolific. You've got the sardines that, that make the bait balls. You've got um, red eye sardines, which is another type of sardine. You've got mackerel, you've got suri, you've got anchovy. You've got a smorgasbord of, of, of fish that is bait that's coming up at that time of the year. So it depends what action you've got as to whether we use scuba or whether we use snorkel. So if it's whale, um, normally we'll always use snorkel because it's very quick in the water, out the water. Although we've had uh, in the past couple of years, our experience um, and encounters with the whales have, have been um, uh, sort of much more extended. In, in the past, because the whales are migrating, you, you have to jump in the water at the right time when the whale comes up to breathe. So you get, to, you get the interaction of the whale as it goes past. But now we're getting situations where that whale will stay around for hours and just play with you. Um, that started about where we had the one whale. It, it played with, with us. All, if, if all the boats managed to get in the water and play with this whale. I, I, I actually posted a memory of it on my Facebook uh, this morning. That's what remind me, reminded me of it. And every year thereafter, uh, we've always had some, some whales that have stopped and interacted with the divers, you know, on snorkel. They, they, they come and sky hop and they swim past and around, just playing like we were dolphins. They love playing with the dolphins. And these particular whales also love playing with us as divers, you know. Cool. So um, whether, whether sardines or, or whether, whether the fish that the, the dolphins and, and sharks are feeding on is, is uh, sort of mobile, you know, you get, you get in the sardine run, you get mobile action and you got static action. The, the sardines that we after provide more the static action, that static bait ball that stays there for a long time, gives you all the... Uh, uh, chances to to view that natural predation take your photos and videos etc so that would be on scuba where where it's red eyes and the 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 bait ball is moving all the time then to be on scuba sometimes is difficult because you you know you've got to follow that bait ball around as as it gets chased um, sometimes we have an impact on the bait ball uh, if it's a small bait ball um, the predators are put off by, uh, by putting a whole group of, say, six people on, in the water at the same time. So we've, we've got to devise a strategy where we impact less on the predators because as soon as the, 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 the sardines know that, um, you know, uh, the predators are scared of us, phew, they're gone, you know. So, and then uh, the, the, you'll see as, they, as that bait ball moves off, the, the dolphins will quickly round it up about 10 meters away. So by putting less people in the water and, and using it like a rotation system, so two people, 15 minutes, two people, two people, and you keep going, you keep the action going a lot longer in that way. All right, got you. And uh, so, now, now but, you're talking about some interesting protocols, and I'm sure you're not the only one over there, so there must be few operators. Are you guys all following this sort of procedure? I, I don't, I'm not sure what sort of procedure they follow, but... Uh, this is what I've learned in the, in the 23 years odd that I've been doing this, you know. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, some people only go out there on snorkel. So, you know, when you, when you throw somebody on top of a, of a, of a good bait ball on snorkel, you, you end up impacting on, on the bird activity uh, mm. as well, you know, sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't matter what you do, everything just goes, carries on going. But a lot of the time, We've got, to, we've got to look at the situation, read the, the um, what, what would I say, read the, the, uh, the signs, you know, and then act accordingly. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Based on the your only experience, thing that 23 we years. agree on as, as multiple operators is that if, if I find the bait ball, that bait ball's mine and my people go in it. 
You know, you, you can't have another 10 boatloads arriving and just throwing their, their divers on. And uh, this happened a few times in the past. And uh, until we all got together and said, look, there's got to be some kind of protocol. Uh, the person that finds a bait ball, that's his bait ball and belong to his boats. And he will invite whoever else he wants to come in and, and if the bait ball goes on for, for any length of time. Fair, fair um, enough. That's nice. Yeah. How many hours uh, are you able to spend uh, out uh, at sea during a day of sardine run? Normally, we spend about at least five hours. You know, we go out in the morning around half past seven, seven, half past seven, depending how, how quick the divers are. And uh, we come back at around two o'clock. So a good five hours every day, you know, chasing, chasing the fish around. Are you using spotter planes still or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we pioneered uh, that, that aspect as well. We, we realized that it's a big ocean out there and to have a micro light, um, you know what a micro light is, eh? Yep. Like a delta, delta wing with a little lawnmower engine on the back and off they go. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it, the, the, the guy you've got in the micro light is pretty important because um, he's got to be able to read what he sees from the air. And I always thought that, you know, what's the difficulty with these people to go out there and find me a patch of a thousand, two thousand birds diving in the water? Well, from up there, let me tell you, that patch of one thousand, two thousand birds looks like a match head. Yeah. If you can imagine a white match head on a blue canvas, and you've got to have very good eyes to pick that up. And, uh, it comes with experience, obviously. And uh, the guy we use, uh, Larry, uh, we call him Sparrow. Uh, he is super, super good at it. Good eyes. Yeah. Excellent. Well, it sounds uh, it sounds really yeah, some amazing. incredible experience. And uh, definitely, we're going to be into it. And uh, we try to bring also our followers to this I've spectacle. In, I've been invited twice, and it's always fallen through every time. Annoying. Yeah. And then, you know, like no, when, is, when, when things like this COVID-19 happening, you have all this like three months of uh, meditation in which you think like, you know, all the time I postponed something, you know, and uh, now maybe I don't get yeah. the chance to go again. So as soon as there is a chance, that is something that everyone should experience at least one time in their life, right? No, absolutely. But, uh, the, the, you know, you got to have... Um, Realistic expectations. Um, I would say 80% um, of the people go away with, with experiencing the natural predation. Uh, you'll always get the person that, that wants bigger, more shark. He didn't get a bride's whale coming through, you know. But, um, you know, the, 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 the thing is that the, the, the possibility is there for an experience that you will not have anywhere else in the world. Yeah. I can say that confidently. I've, I've, I've been, I've done quite a few different things. And uh, uh, as I said previously, the only thing that's really tested my, uh, my uh, uh, ability to get in the water and say, do you really want this has been the sardine run. Wow. And, uh, you know, fantastic experience not only from the point of view of the action in the water but the variety of animals that you see the the coastline the the place we stay at in Boiki is such a it's a rural it's a little pearl in the in this in this emerald green forest you know Excellent. and uh it is really spectacular uh go out there don't expect too much and you might just go away with everything. Excellent. That's, That's sounds, what I would like. That sounds <laughs> awesome. You also pioneered, uh, I guess you pioneered that uh, crocodile dive uh, in, in, in the Nile, right? Yes. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, prior to us, uh, you know, there were a few expeditions that, that went down, um, but they were all uh, for National Geographic or Discovery. And uh, we brought the, the normal person into, uh, oh, okay. to be able to experience that dive. 
And uh, my introduction to it was, um, uh, there was a trilogy done uh, for a discovery, I think it was. It was uh, Slayer, Touch the Dragon, and The Dragon's Feast, which I was involved with, the last one. I think uh, by the third one, they couldn't get anybody <laughs> else to join, or Roger Horrocks, to do the filming. So, uh, yeah, they, they got me involved. And uh, that's where I learned, you know, a little bit about the crocodiles and, and how to dive with them, how to, the, the most, the most uh, important thing is how to find them, you know, how to, how to uh, and how to dive with them in a, to take a, a photographer with you that's not a professional uh, to be able to experience that in a safe way. Right. And uh, basically, that's that's what we pioneered up there. Okay. okay. Um, Excellent. But now we're talking about something different because, like, when we talk about sharks uh, or let's say ocean animal, we we not really like in, in the food chain, you know, or like we are more like a guest over there. And but now crocodiles is some animal that uh, they can eat us. We have them also this side of the world, like in Indonesia where we are, and uh, well. Salty, salt water crocodiles, they're quite bitey. And uh, what about the Nile ones? Uh, how are they? <laughs> no, well, uh, we are very high on their menu. Eh? Uh, I think something like uh, 2,000 people a year uh, die right. uh, because of crocodiles. Eh? So uh, we're very high on their menu, but underwater, they don't quite understand what we are. And that's our saving grace. Uh, the, the other thing that we use to our advantage is we go there in winter. So the water is cold, uh, 14 to 18 degrees. Ah, okay. Uh, the outside temperature is also cold. So they're slower. Um, so it, it slows them. they reptiles, so it slows them down. Also, you know, the, their trigger is the surface. When there's disruption on the surface, that's when they... they, they uh, alerted and that's when they will act so we try and minimize our time on the surface um you know by various uh, skills that we learn as as we go along um okay one last thing is that, one thing i want to really ask you because like this sounds very interesting but you still went in the water with them and you said you pioneered the thing like with, by bringing other people in there so that means you, you went to do something new you know and to to learn about that and what was your approach like on that first dive and first crocodile when you went inside? Uh, well, I'll tell you my first experience, you know. They, uh, you know, I didn't know. I asked different people. I, I asked around uh, some people that had croc farms and stuff like that to try and, and understand these creatures a bit more before I got in the water with them. But I, I didn't get much information from anybody. And when I, after they had done the first two of the trilogy, um, I asked, and, and, the, and the, the Roger said to me, you know, uh, when you get in the water, you want to look on the banks and the reeds, because that's where these things are hiding. You know, they're in that, they camouflage, and, and they love sitting in the sunlight, where the sunlight is playing on the reeds. They've got that golden skin, and they blend in perfectly. Well, I was looking up on the banks, what I didn't realize, you get two sort of colorations. One is like the golden coloration, where it's a nice, uh, golden, beautiful looking uh, croc. The other one is very dark, almost black. You know? So the black one is not going to sit in the reeds. The black one sits, you know, the sand on the bottom of the Okavango is white, like uh, it's a silica sand. When you touch it, it squeaks. But the banks are... are black clay and and part of the bank falls down and they look like rocks underwater some big boulders some smaller boulders but it's not rocks it's clay and the big ones the big black ones like to sit there because they they very well blend in with that with that uh, with that color so there i'm going along and uh, i'm looking up at the bank looking up at the bank and i just happen to look back down again <laughs> and when i look back down this monster was lying right in front of me i mean oh. i've got such a fright 
and this crocodile got such a fright at the same time <laughs> that it it dashed off on that way. I dashed off that way, and that was my first encounter with with the Nile croc. And uh, from there, I started learning because I'm the I'm the spotter when it comes to the you're in the front. So we normally have the spotter in the front, the the customer in the middle. And the and the guard who brought the the people uh, trailing, okay. And we go down like a like a snake. Me in the front, then the customer, then the thing. So you you are at the sharp end, you know. So you got to make sure that you can see clearly in front of you whatever the visibility is. Sometimes the vis can be, you know, eight meters to fifteen meters, but sometimes that vis gets right down to you know, three or four meters. When it's less than three meters, you're wasting your time getting in right. the water. So you got to make sure that the, the three meters that you're scanning is clear before you start looking anywhere else. Because if you don't, you know, you're going to get the same experience as I did. You know, when you look back down, you're going to be in the mouth of this thing. Also, it's a river. So there's current. You got to learn how to navigate down the current, keeping your head down current all the time. You know, when, you, when you're in a current, your head always swings into the current. And you're, you know, so you've got to be able to, to um, you know, uh, stay with your head facing down current all the time so you can see what's coming. And no use going backwards because you're not going to survive long that way. Right. right. So uh, different skills that we've, we've had to learn through the school of Knox and luckily... Uh, survived them, you know. <laughs> I mean, I got been chomped by that first crocodile, and I just happened to look back down at the right moment, which saved my my butt, you know. Yeah. Um, so all those experiences, uh, we we take away and we say, what can we learn from that? Okay, we mustn't do this, this, and this. Okay, and and so you know, um, we we pick that uh, enables us to dive with them. In a, in a safe manner, and uh, you know Nile crocs, uh, you know they reptiles, so they're very hard to predict, and wow. and like I say, be very high on their menu. Yep. So yeah, you yeah. have to be extremely cautious. I tell you, I'm 100 down for the sardine run, Aliwal shoal, croc. I'm not yet. It's not for everyone, you know. <laughs> and then, would there also be hippos in there too? Yeah. Oh yes, oh, they're There's even worse. There. Oh, they're okay. even worse. There's so, a possibility that you could bump a hippo, and you know that thing there is, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's always pissed off. Eh? Yeah, yeah. It hates people coming into its area. So if you see a hippo, you got to pedal into the deep water as fast as you can. You know, right. everyone for themselves, basically. So. Um, they How? can chase you underwater. You know, that hippo, is, is, his whole head is like a foil. You know, the, the, the foil they use in racing cars. Yep. Yeah. That keep the, the, the downward force on the racing car on, on the back. The, the same as the hippo. Is, its head is shaped like a foil. So when it runs underwater, you know, it's, it's charging underwater. Like that, that, that shape is holding it down. And uh, the, the saving grace is that when it opens its mouth, it's like a drogue anchor. It suddenly stops. So if you if you fast enough getting away into the deeper water, it, it can't operate in in too deep water. You know, okay. it's, it's got to stay within a certain depth, and you hightail it for the middle of the river and <laughs> uh, <laughs> and have this thing chasing you. I've never been chased by one. Uh, I've only experienced. Uh, Seeing the, the 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 back end of one and then quickly moving away. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so definitely, is, like, uh, what it sounds like is, uh, and what it is, is that uh, you take all uh, the proper precautions to die with this uh, sort of animals that uh, can be. I wouldn't say, yeah, they can be dangerous if approached in the wrong way, you know, like by making some mistakes uh, could uh, potentially be dangerous, but by taking the right precautions, we can do that in a safe uh, manner, right? 100%, 100%. 
You, you know, every every animal, every uh, um, uh, even on land, I think, with the right protocol, you can interact with wild animals. And um, it's just a matter of learning the right protocol and surviving. So far, uh, I've managed to survive and <laughs> yeah. learn from my mistakes. That's right. the most important. Thing. Yeah. You know, not inadvertently making a mistake uh, purposefully, but you know it happening and then going back and analyzing uh, what actually happened there. And okay, let's learn from this experience and uh, put it into our briefing mm. and uh, you know uh, and take it to the next make, step. Make the dive safer for everybody else. Absolutely. And so one last thing, when you do the crocodile, also you can mix some safari-like experience together or you just focus on crocodiles? So I'm sorry, I, I missed that Some what experience? When uh, you do the crocodile experience, uh, the tour, you also have uh, a day in which you go to see other animals or you just focus on uh, crocodiles? Um, look, uh... When we're doing crocs, uh, you, you're spending most of the day on the river, you know, chasing crocodiles. And, um, you know, you could have an add-on for a safari where you can go out and, and uh, to a different area to do the, 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 you know, see all the wild animals. The, the area where we're working in, you know, you get hippos, you get crocodiles, you get elephants. Um, but not a lot of other wild game, you know, that I've seen there. Um, gotcha. So you're working between these big papyrus banks all the time. So there could be anything in there, mm. but but you, you physically can't see it from the river. Yeah. And um, it is, it's specifically this part of the river that we go to for the crocs, because the papyrus filters that water and cleans it up when the rains uh, in the in in in, uh, in june you get the rains on the golden heights and then that flushes out the the, the delta and uh, goes down river <clears throat> it's the only river that doesn't run into the sea it, okay. it runs into and disappears into the desert and um, so the, you know the, the wildlife thing you would have to go to do it properly and see a, a nice variety of wildlife you would have to do like an add-on safari to to uh, justify it, you know? All right. Gotcha. Yeah. But I guess the people that want to do crocodiles, they just think about crocodiles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. They're just thinking about crocodiles. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks so much, uh, Walter. We're going to put uh, the links uh, of, uh, of your company and uh, people can... Uh, refer directly in the description of uh, this uh, live show that we had together. And we're really looking for the, you know, the next chance uh, to put together a group and uh, coming down and uh, visit Sardine Runs and uh, me also, the Tiger Shark, I yeah, would be exactly. very, very interested to very do like. So. so maybe more than once. Eh? <laughs> That's fantastic. So, thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Walter, and thanks again for joining day. us. Bye. Bye-bye. And that was a great uh, interview with uh, Walter Bernardis. Fantastic uh, insights, right? Very Lots. entertaining and great photos from Eduardo. Thank you for uh, allowing us to thanks, use those Edo. as well. Yeah, I got really, really, you know, like the more people we're interviewing and all this great experience out there, I'm really getting itchy for more some... you want to go somewhere? amazing experience and if you're getting itchy too about that actually we are looking into it uh, and uh, probably organizing something for next year around this time of the year so one year from now so yep. you can send us uh, some message if you're interested to go there back to the question that we asked earlier before we said you know who wants to go now we'll ask the question again after seeing the photos and hearing the stories right who wants to go on the sardine run now mm -mm. Show of hands, everyone, show of hands. Here we go. So, you know, like, actually what I'm thinking is, like, to park uh, ourselves down there for three weeks and then people can decide do the whole right. thing. So, come one week like that or That's come three way. days, uh, like, uh, uh, up to you. Sometimes you got to think about the weather as well, so a little bit longer. Mm. Yeah, that's why I want to your... stay three weeks because, you know, like, so you get that moment, that day that is, like, wow. That perfect, beautiful blue water. Really, wow.
32 degrees, uh, yeah. Christopher. Nice and uh, I'm also very, very interested to go to see crocodiles and hippos, but not in the water. Yeah. I will watch them from, so... you know, those nice jeep that they have with a nice lunch box there on the side and every now and big camera, long lens and... Actually, one of our, our other South African guests uh, that was here before, she just sent me a video earlier of an amazing, some people having an amazing experience with elephants and the elephants coming right there. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, that'll 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 scare the poop out of you when they're right there in front of you. Africa. Yes. Let's do it. Twenty twenty one. Twenty twenty one. A year from now. Yes. Wow. But he said that if you want to see the tiger shark, uh, it's better in February. Right. So it's not, it's not really like the the the, the right time to do that. But definitely you can also do some dives in Unkumas uh, yep. and uh, Aliwal, and you can see the regis, right? Yep, you can do, uh, you do, you, you fly into Durban and then you do a few days around there mm -hmm. and then you go down for the sardine run. Yeah. And then back up. And don't worry about the temperature. It's cold, but we can get this, uh, you know, like warmer vest, uh, heating vest. That we should ask. Yes. We uh, can start selling those here on the show. Definitely going to get those uh, from uh, our buddy in, uh, in Japan that uh, makes that, Kazu from Fisheye Japan. I think it's a very good tool to have it in sure such would. a situation. Even outside the water, well. you you can start like to to warm up yourself. Well, I think when you got action like that, you probably don't even notice so much the the, the cold. You, you'll notice it when you first jump in, you go, Duh! but as soon as you see the action, ah, yeah, it goes away. Yeah. And more, more mostly, so you know, stay on the boat. I think. I think what you need is is a good jacket for when you're sitting on the boat. Yeah, a nice big parka. Yes, my Canadian parka will come in. Well, what's a parka? I, a parka like a big jacket, the hood. <laughs> So really why don't jacket. you say just a big jacket with a hood? Because it's called a parka. It's not called a windbreaker. It's called a parka. And what is that that he's wearing? It's called a toque. A toque. Come on, man. Okay. It's not the. It's not there anymore. It's, it's, it's not. It's but he's there. I can it's see him right here now. on my screen. Well, guys. A toque and a parka. This was uh, show number forty-eight, and oui? I hope that uh, you enjoyed it. And thanks again uh, to Walter Bernardis for this great interview, and thanks again also to Eduardo uh, Spaka for showing uh, for giving us access to some beautiful photos to show you during the great uh, narrative given by Walter. Uh, and it's very, it's very good. It's good. Very, very he was a great, yeah. yeah, very entertaining, great storyteller. And I like the part when he said, like, uh, yeah, how he saw his first crocodile, that he was looking everywhere. <laughs> where is he? Where is it? And whoa, it was hey. right below him. Like, That's how I saw my that first must be too. so spooky, you know, super, super spooky. Don't want to really do that. Guys. Who do we have on episode number 49? Episode number 49, we have uh, the amazing Doug Perrine. Yes. Coming up on Friday. So Friday is going to be a morning show. It's not going to be on the same time like now. So we're going to catch also people from the US. Doug is from US, from the US and is based in Hawaii. So we want to have him also there in the comments. Also some amazing um, sardine run photos that Doug will share with us. Yeah, so more sharks coming up, guys. And we'll, that will bring us towards to the end of uh, Shark, Week. Shark Week, but we will still talk about sharks because it's uh, some of our favorite the, animals. Can we use the, the hashtag Shark Week for ourselves instead of, you know, yes. Discovery Channel? Yeah, absolutely. The Underwater Tribe Shark Week. Yes, because we portray them very beautifully. And we're first. The way that is supp supposed to be portrayed. Yes, one more thing I want to add to this. Go. So guys, don't forget, if you want to brush up your photography skills and get the online one-to-one -one with Mike, you can actually send us an email and we ha or go to our website underwatertribe.com and we have there um, a nice one-to-one uh, -one, uh, photography Special? lesson specialized on uh, you. Basically, it's going to be customized on your experience and how to bring you to the next level. So. As uh, diving locations are reopening, many people in Europe diving Europe uh, right now, people in Australia diving in Australia. So um, people in England diving in England. I have always to make this distinction English, now yes. in Europe and England. Different. Exactly. Right. So it's time to brush up your skills and you can do that with a 45 minutes lesson with our most experienced underwater photographer at the Underwater Tribe. Who is that? 
Uh, I don't know. That's you, man. That's you. And in case you haven't noticed it, I'm getting back a little bit of a tan. I can see that on your laptop. Wow, look yeah. at you. Yeah, yeah. you I've been working on it in my garden because we cannot go still anywhere. But tomorrow is going to change. You spent the weekend at the pool, admit it. Big things changing. You spent Saturday lying by the pool. Yeah, I went a little bit at the pool. See? Right, guys, that's it for today. Don't forget again to give a like to the show. Just take two seconds. Just like the show. Like the show and share. share it with your friends and if you haven't liked our facebook page please like the facebook page and follow it and also if you're watching us on youtube do the same please subscribe like uh, this show and uh, write down a comment and we will be staying in the comment section also afterwards so we're gonna even if we, you're not watching it live we are still gonna be there answering we're, your we're questions we're pretty good at answering pretty much all comments oh, we're always on top of it we're, we're always on top of the game and if you would like to support the underwater tribe here in Bali, we also put a few links in the description that uh, you can use uh, to send some support to us uh, and our dive uh, service here in Bali and the team. Right, and don't forget again to go to have a look at uh, Walter Bernardi's uh, um, social media account. We also put it there in the description and also Eduardo Spacca that he has some great images from the Sardine Run. Get more of his more of his images as well yeah. and that brings us to the closure of uh, another show on wednesday. not another week another show yes that's the end of wednesday wednesday yep. and we're gonna hump see week, you all hump, hump on day. friday see you guys on friday goodbye